Thanks again for joining for the Lightning Talks. We have two today. The first one is from Denise van der Cruz. Uh, she's been building sites for over 20 years and she's very passionate about empowering people through technology. Uh, she has spearheaded a mentorship program for young people as well. Um, she's one of the, oh, you'll be leading organizer for Paris World Camp, no, oh, no, the, for the Vienna World Camp. And she was the organizer in the previous Vienna World Camp as well, weren't you? I was a speaker. You were a speaker, yeah. right. And um, she builds now sites through her company, Girlbot. Today she'll be talking about um, working up for, across different time zones. Um, so I will be talking about working across time zones. For the last few years, I've been working uh, at On The Go Systems. Are people familiar with that? They make WPML and tool sets. And it's an entirely remote company. Um, and I love to travel. So this year alone, last year, 2016, for example, I spent the entire summer in the Caribbean. So I was in South America and Haiti in the Dominican Republic. Um, and I'm in Scotland a lot. <laughs> I'm in Copenhagen a lot. So I love to travel. So this is something that is near and dear to my heart because wherever I go, I have to work uh, my full day. Uh, so today I'll be talking about how to work across time zones, not just within your company, but for your client's sake as well. How many, by a show of hands, how many of you work remotely? Okay, good. That's great. <laughs> I think that is uh, one of the great opportunities that jobs within uh, WordPress uh, create. So. Um, that's the slide about me. You could reach me at Solchika on, on Twitter. Good. So let's talk about structuring a remote project. You, you're in your remote island and you want to work with collaborators to get something done in WordPress. What do you have to make sure happens? Um, so the first thing that you have to think about is your legal structure. How will you set yourself up legally to work with people all across the world? And there are different models for doing that. Some people organize in um, a particular country that allows them to do that and contract with other people. Other people do it so that people are actually recognized employees with no fixed place. It really just depends on how you want to organize yourself for legal purposes and tax purposes. And it depends on your particular situation. So, but this is something that you really need to think about. Um, especially within the EU, we have pretty strict uh, labor laws um, in Austria and Vienna particularly. So you wanna make sure that you're not running afoul of that. Another thing that needs to happen here is that your vision needs to be clearly defined. How many of you have gotten um, asked to do something and someone talked to you for about two hours or so and at the end of the two hours you weren't quite sure what you were just asked to do? <laughs> right, that happens a lot, that happens a lot. Sometimes we, we get very fired up about doing something and we get people on board but we're not really sure what we're asking people to do. And this is very, very important, especially in this ecology of WordPress, because you're dealing with people with multiple skills. So sometimes you might be dealing with someone who could be a developer, but maybe they could be a supporter. Um, maybe they could be a project lead. And they need to know exactly what you need for your project. So that's, that's key. You have to define your vision and where you want people to come in on that vision with you. Um, and in accordance with that, the roles have to be spelled out. What do you do in the project? Are you just the guy that has ideas or will you be working in the project alongside everyone else? So that also has to be spelled out. So the thing about um, remote projects is that there they cannot be as nebulous as projects that are based on a physical location, right? Because if we're all working together in an office um, and I'm unsure about something, I just tap you on your shoulder and say, hey, I'm unsure about this. What, what are we doing? But if we're working remotely and perhaps we don't overlap the entire day, those opportunities are not as plentiful. So 
a lot of time may get wasted just in the lack of clarity. And the last thing I would say that's really important here when you're structuring your remote project is to think about culture. Culture, um, I think people think culture is something that you could only really um, influence if you're in people's presence. But even when you have a remote team, you still can really determine what your company culture, what your project culture will look like. And that has to do with things like how are you communicating with people, right? How are you uh, asking people for things? Um, what does it look like in terms of are you talking to them every day? Do you have a daily check-in? Or do you talk to people once and then you see them in a month when the deadline happens? So think about how the, the culture is going to play itself out and if that will meet your needs. So I made a little toolkit here. Um, if I knew I would be um, <laughs> taking up this much time, I would have done a much more bulleted. Um, I, I love slides, but <laughs> at first I had so many slides, and they were like, you have to pare down the slides. So I have to tell you a lot um, that I would love to give you bulleted points for, um, because I have a lot of recommendations about everything here. And I'm sure that. Um, you guys have recommendations too since so many of you have worked remotely. So if you're working remotely and you're working across time zones, what is important? One is a scheduling system. If you're in Asia and I'm in Europe, we need to be really clear how we're organizing our times so that we have at least some overlap. Um, in, my, in my old position, I had to onboard people that were coming in from all across the world. So that would mean that if I had to deal with someone in Asia, for example, I would have to get up early and they would have to stay up late a bit so that we could have a significant chunk of time, especially during the onboarding process, where I could walk them through certain things. Um, so scheduling system is really important, especially in the beginning. There are some companies that don't really allow remote employees until they have been working at a company for some years or for a significant amount of time. And the reason that happens is because when you have this overlapping time, you're able to establish certain things with people. They can ping you for questions, you can do an orientation, you can do your training with them. Um, this is a really important building time. So especially in the beginning of a relationship, what I would recommend is no matter where you are in the world, that you find a period of time and you both sort of meet halfway so that you can have some significant overlap. Um, even if that significant overlap only happens for a period of weeks or the first couple of months. Um, another thing uh, that's important is uh, a project or bug system. So um, who here has used a base camp? or yeah, jet brains, right? So whatever it is, it has to be consistent and it has to meet your needs. And what this system has to do is to track issues and to track accountability of those issues. So who's working on it when? How long are they working on it? What are the important resources that uh, need to be logged with this issue? Whatever tool you use, it has to have those things. Um, another thing that I would recommend is a document bank. So a lot of companies use Google Docs for this, um, but you could use whatever works, Dropbox, um, any kind of uh, online cloud storage system or even a, a, a hosted um, system. But there has to be a place where you have your virtual file cabinet. Chat tool, live conferencing, um, so that could be Skype, that could be um, Slack for the chat tool, for example. And um, uh, client management and backup information. So what kind of tools could we use for like client management? Can you guys, what, what kind of tools do you guys use for client management? Trello. Trello, Trello right? So, Confluence, okay, cool. So it, 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 there are so many tools out there right now. Some people use Asana, right? Which is similar to Trello in some ways. 
I just started using Trello, it's a great tool. Um, and backup is absolutely essential. You don't want the bulk of your data to be sitting in any one person's computer because anything can happen to that computer. All right, so when you're hiring remotely and you're dealing with remote collaborators, one thing to, to really realize is, is the most essential element of dealing with these people will be trust. These have, to be, these have to be people that you can trust and they need to be able to trust you. And how does that happen? That happens through accountability, following through, and making sure that you're very clear with each other about what needs to happen. Um, so when you're, when you're hiring and you're looking for someone, make sure that there are people that have a proven track record. Um, and the, the, the next part of that is that you have to, have to, have to allow them to take ownership of what they are supposed to do. So one thing that is very hard to do with a remote team is micromanaging. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to do that anyway, but it's, it's especially hard to do with, um, with a remote team. So this all kind of leads into managing expectations. That getting to know you phase uh, in, the, in the remote relationship is as important as, as anything you will do afterwards because that's the period that you clarify how you're going to be working with them and how they're going to be working with you. This is something that is important for your client relationships as well. If you're dealing with clients that are outside of a time zone that you have full support of, they need to know what window within their time zone can they expect immediate support. So managing expectations uh, of your clients and of your collaborators is a huge part of successfully managing a remote team. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, good. Um, so, uh, the happy ending. <laughs> Um, when, when all of these things are done, you should have a mutually beneficial relationship and, and look back on it and have freedom that you wouldn't normally have within a physical location. Um, and I think I'm out of time because <laughs> it's a lightning session. So thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Um, does anyone have anything else to add or questions? Start. I'll come back there. You mentioned um, scheduling time zones. Mm -hmm. but, um, have you got any tips on how to actually schedule the actual workload of the remote team? How to schedule the workload of the remote Maybe. team? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't wear your glasses. <laughs> how to schedule, how to manage the workload of the remote yeah, team. Yeah, you can't see people, so you, you don't get a sense of like when they're stressed and they're overloaded. And similarly, you don't okay. get a sense of when they're sitting, sitting twiddling their thumbs and, and don't have enough to do. Okay. Have you got any sort of yeah, I have some, some ideas about that. The first thing is that because you've got this wonderful tracking system, bug system, or support, ticket system. Everything is very transparent. So one thing that you should think about is that you're dealing with very smart people. So Bob in Utah knows exactly how much work his counterpart in Egypt did, right? So you want, the first thing that you have to think about is it has to be equitable. It has to feel fair because when it starts to not feel fair, then you have other problems within your company culture. Um, that's the first part. But then again, uh, not everyone may have equal capabilities, and so you want to make sure that they're supported and that there's adequate training and systems in place so that when they don't feel like they have the, are equipped with the tools that they need to do their job, that they can get those tools. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, my, my question is quite similar. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. 
how do your clients feel about you being on the beach when you're working? How, how do you, yeah, how do you focus, you mean, or? Well, uh, that as well, but how do your clients feel about it, and how do you deal with that? Well, in my position, I didn't do a ton of video uh, chat. So the video that I did was just with our team, our internal team. And they were like, great, send pictures. <laughs> so the, you, because everyone understood, um, we had team members that just traveled the world. They didn't have a fixed place that they lived most of the time. They just would spend a month here or two months here. Um, one thing that I will say about being in different parts of the world is this summer I, w I was in places that I w was in for the very first time. And what that means is that uh, I ran into uh, odd situations where my internet access didn't always work the way that I needed it to work. And that's the hardest thing. So always try to go into a situation where you have some certainties around what your access is going to be. Um, even if that means uh, that you, you know, find a relationship with um, an hot a hotel, whether you stay there or not, but that you have a relationship with them that, okay, I can use your internet, or uh, possibly a business that, that has a, a high-speed internet connection that is there that you say, hey, I'm, I'm coming into town and things might go out because <laughs> I was there during hurricane season and a strong wind would be like, oh no. So, yeah, that's the only thing that I could uh, warn against. And um, discipline as well, to go and get a full eight hours a day? Yeah, uh, for me, the, the way that I dealt with it when I w was traveling is that, you know, when pe most people travel, they really, they sleep in late. If they're having a, a nice vacation, they would sleep in until, let, let's say, 10 or 11. So the way that I would uh, deal with wanting to go out and see new places, yet at the same time needing to get some work done, was I'd wake up very early, I'd start my day at like 5 a.m. And so uh, in the afternoon, I could actually just go and enjoy things. Um, so it really just depends if you're a morning person, use that to your advantage. Um, figure out when is this town sleeping, uh, because not only will it be great for you to do your work, uh, because you can focus and everyone's quiet and you don't have a lot of noise around you, but then you still get to go out and explore. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pass the mic. Thank you so much for listening. Shall I start introducing Mark? And I'm hoping that it's not long that he's got everything going. So Mark's uh, a former geography and ICT teacher and he started using WordPress in 2005. Uh, he's now a WordPress developer and a business owner of an agency called High Rise Digital. Fun fact of the day that I learned today, that Mark and Keith, uh, Keith Devin, who's um, um, Mark's business partner, they both are really tall people and that's why they call themselves High Rise Digital. <laughs> Uh, so Mark's going to talk about uh, how computing is done in the UK schools. Take it away. Thanks. Right, so first of all, apologies. This is all a bit last minute and a bit rushed. Um, so obviously I've been sitting in for someone else. So um, apologies if it's not quite as polished as it would have been. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to get through. I'm also having to present on this different screen. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about computing in UK schools. Um, and maybe a bit at the end is like what perhaps WordPress's role in that could be. Um, as, um, as you just heard, I used to be a teacher. Um, so I was a teacher from 2002 until 2014. So I've got some experience of the sort of thing that you know this is about. Um, and I'm now a developer and business owner. And I've been using WordPress quite a while. So. You know, why is it important that you guys perhaps want to know about what's important about it being taught in, in UK schools or schools around the world as, as a matter in terms of computing? Um, and I think obviously as the web gets bigger and starts to grow, it's still relatively in its infancy. We're going to need more and more people working in the web. And those people are going to come from schools, they're going to come from colleges. Um, so what they're actually being taught in there now is probably of good in, uh, interest to most of us in terms of what can they do, what skills have they got coming out of schools and colleges. Um, you know, and how can we best use those skills, maybe if someone that's looking to employ those people, etc. So, you know, I think it is important that uh, we have a broad knowledge of what's being taught, just like we do with other subjects. Um, and the reason why this uh, might be important 
particularly now, is that there's been a massive change with ICT and computers uh, and the way it's been taught in the UK schools in the last sort of three or four years. So pre-2013, um, uh, the, the actual subject was called ICT, Information and Communication Technology. Um, and there was very little computing actually in that curriculum at all. So essentially, um, it was sort of like using computers and using software to obviously solve problems and to do uh, different tasks. So previous to 2013, this document was the government document, the national curriculum for ICT, which told teachers what they actually had to deliver in those lessons. Um, so it's a very pretty design, but very old now. And these are the things that essentially, as teachers back then, we had to sort of deliver. So it was split into key concepts and into key processes. So it was a little bit about communication and collaboration. So there was a bit about you know, how we communicate with each other, with the tools we can use for that. Um, manipulating information. So for that, we did a lot of stuff with like spreadsheets and using spreadsheets and how to use the formulas and functions in spreadsheets, things like that. So a lot of sort of Excel stuff in there. Um, the impact that technologies had on the world. So this, when this curriculum was designed, it was kind of like in the mid to late 90s when sort of technology had really just started in terms of computers and the internet. So a lot of it was teaching what impact that might have on society and the community. And I guess that's still relevant today, obviously, but perhaps for slightly different uh, ways in which it's relevant. Um, and then the key process was uh, finding information. So we had this vast new web that we'd never come across before and how on earth do we f use it to find information and find stuff that we want. So there was a lot about teaching like, you know, how to search for things, um, you know, relevant stuff, I guess. Um, and then let's communicate information. Oh, it's been twice then, never mind. Um, and then developing ideas. So developing the ideas of, of things uh, using different pieces of software. And it came to sort of about um, 2000 and 11, 12-ish, and there became a lot of discontent with this sort of curriculum. Um, so I've got a few quotes here from some of the, some people. This guy um, is a quote from Ian Livingston, who is, who was, or I don't know if he still is, or he was. He has his own uh, games workshop type company, and he is also a government and business advisor on sort of technology. He, he also wrote the Fighting Fantasy books, which I didn't realise, um, which you might have read when you were little. I did. You used to like roll a dice, and, and then you had to fight like different things with it. So that was quite interesting. Uh, with Steve Jackson, he wrote loads of those. So he had a good experience in this. And this was a quote from him. So he said, "Children have been forced to learn how to use applications rather than actually how to make them." Um, so we're just sort of churning out a. a, a, a a lot of people that can just use things rather than making them. And it says they're becoming slaves to the user interface and they're just totally bored by it. That was quite a bold statement. I'm not, I think there's some children obviously enjoyed what they were doing, but I think what he said did have some merit and that we were actually just teaching kids to use Microsoft Office um, and to use these pieces of software that comes out on computers rather than actually think about how they were built and can we make our own and what can we do with them. Uh, this was a quote from uh, a head of computing that I used to work with. Um, and he says that in the 21st century, there is a much greater need to develop learners for the future. The curriculum now focuses on thinking about problem solving skills, whereas pupils learn to create software and not just use it. So again, he was quite interested in the fact that instead of just using these pieces of software, we're going to teach them the skills and the coding standards and structures to be able to actually create these things for themselves to use and solve problems with. So that's how kind of the, the, the curriculum has, has, has changed really. So we've moved from, from ICT into computing, and you'll have to bear with me now, so I've got to catch up on this laptop to see my speaker notes, um, which is fine. Um, and obviously that, that raised some challenges uh, in schools because uh, we had a set of staff that were delivering ICT. A lot of the time, a lot of those weren't particularly ICT focused. They were from other subjects and, and ended up doing ICT. And all of a sudden, they were being told that you need to know how to program and you need to be able to teach this. And that was a big, big shock to a lot of people, including me. <laughs> um, so we moved over to a curriculum, com uh, a computing curriculum, excuse me. So we completely changed the name of this subject. It, it was got a completely different name. It was no longer called information communication technology. It was now called computing. And even today, you still get teachers and educational staff still calling it ICT when it's changed its name four years ago almost now. So it just shows you how long a culture has to change for it to become sort of ingrained. Um, so yeah, an, a new sort of name. Um, this is kind of what the curriculum now looks like. It's actually much 
simpler. There's less documents about what you have to do, um, but it just goes through some of the, the things that you, 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 know, you need to cover as, um, as a teacher. So Key Stage 1 on the left, if you're not familiar with UK schools, Key Stage 1 is from the years of 4 to 6 ages, uh, years old. Key Stage 2 is from 6 to 11. Key Stage 3 is 11 to 6. Uh, sorry, 11 to 14, and then key stage 4 is from years 14 to 16. So that just gives you some of the ideas about the age of some of the uh, people that are sort of learning these things. And you can see sort of the some stuff that we've got coming in here now. So, um, and some of it is quite surprising that you look at it. So like algorithms is key stage 1. So like you're 4 years old, um, you know, to 6 years old, and you're looking at algorithms. And obviously the way in which you deliver that is going to be highly customised to those, those kids. But it's interesting that they're actually teaching that now. And they're teaching them to debug simple programmes, things we kind of like probably do every day. Um, so it's getting that ingrained. Uh, and using technology to create, store, manipulate, and use technology safely. So that's really coming in at key stage one. You know, it's part of our lives all the time now, so we're trying to deliver that to them you know, very early on, which I think is probably a good idea. Um, key stage two, um, starting to get a bit more advanced in terms of variables, inputs and outputs, uh, using logical reasons, uh, sorry, logical uh, reasons to explain algorithms, so not just sort of using them, trying to get them to understand actually what they are, etc. Understanding about networks and how the internet works. Um, remember, this is between the age of six and 11, so sort of the later stages of primary school. And effective use of search technology. So some of the things have remained. Some of the things are still there. They're still important for today's uh, world. So they've not got rid of everything. And safely using a range of software on a range of devices. And that comes into sort of like e-safety uh, e and things like that and making sure that you know, they know what they're doing online. Moving into key stage three, um, we've got design and use of modelling systems. So, you know, modelling the, the world, if you like, or things around the world. What happens if we do this? What's going to come out? You know, so forth. Um, understanding algorithms, so sorting and selecting. Um, and they have to use, in Key Stage 3, um, two programming languages. So they actually have to learn some programming languages, like we do with JavaScript and PHP and all that. Um, one of them has to be text-based as well, so they actually have to do some proper coding you know, in, in a text editor, which is quite unique and quite different. Um, and sometimes, when we first started teaching this, the, the reaction from the kids was, what? You, you want me to do this? This is something that, you know, people far, far more important and, and uh, intelligent than, than me do. And no, no, you're going to do it. And, you know, they, they got through it quite well. Um, procedures and functions, the Boolean logic, uh, they look at some hardware, so looking at, you know, how computers are put together, etc., and a bit of binary as well. And then in Key Stage 4, the Key Stage 4 curriculum, that's like your GCSE type years, it's kind of a bit, um, bit sparse, really. They don't really stipulate very much. Um, they just say it's computer science. So you've got to do some computer science. Um, you could <laughs> take that a lot of ways. Digital media, which is obviously linking into the web and stuff. Computational thinking, problem solving. Again, keeping that focus of online privacy, so making sure that we're, you know, they're fully aware of that all the time. And obviously, again, they've kept in there that how ch technology changes and impacts us over time and so on. I think when that first came into the curriculum, obviously, it was the introduction of technology. But now it's more how, that, how technology is changing over time and how that's going to impact society. I mean, you think of just social media in the last five, six, seven years and the change that that's had on, on everyone's lives, really, I suppose. So that's what they're actually teaching um, at the moment. Um, bear with me a sec. So yeah, I've, I've mentioned the, the, the challenges that this faced, so in the, in the staffing in particular, um, and a lot of money was spent on, on retraining staff, um, obviously getting new staff in to be able to teach this sort of uh, curriculum course, and you, you got sort of going around schools asking, does anyone know how to do this, and so on, uh, and they were sort of brought in to, to teach those things. Um, and also software, you know, we, 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 schools had basically a Microsoft license to, to run Microsoft Office because that's kind of what they used. They had some other software as well, which actually cost quite a lot of money. And actually a lot of this stuff now could actually be taught for using open source stuff and for free. So actually that was a good thing in, in many ways. But we had to obviously find out what software there was. Um, would it be installed okay on a network in a school, etc. So there's a lot of change to think about in that aspect. And obviously the problem of expertise, you know, do we know how to actually teach this? And that took quite a long time to solve, I'm sure, for, for a lot of schools. So let's have a look at some of the tools and software that they sort of use now to sort of teach um, the coding sort of aspects of um, the, the course or the curriculum. 
So um, I don't know if you've seen this piece of software, it's called Scratch. Um, it's, um, it's actually an online tool and it's to sort of teach the, the principles of coding to, to young uh, people. And it's actually quite good fun if you've never used it. Log on, create an account and have a go at creating some uh, little games and stuff. It's actually quite good fun. So this is the website. It's an online tool. So you, you don't have to create an account to create something, but you can't really save it if you don't create an account. Um, so you can create, it's just, it's all free. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's under the Creative Commons license as well, I think. It's certainly one of the, you know, free, sorry? Oh, I thought you were saying. Um, so this is Scratch. Um, I'll just show you what some of it looks like. So basically Scratch um, tries to teach them the coding methods by showing them code blocks like this. And these are split up into different groupings. Um, I'll show that in the next slide. But as you can see, it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. So the idea is that they've got to put together these pieces of the jigsaw to build up um, whatever they want. It usually create like a game or something. A maze game is quite popular, um, where you've got to navigate something around the maze. And if you, if you touch something, you get, to, um, you get sort of a, a life knocked off or something. Um, so you can see we've got ifs, we've got f loops for forevers and if elses and repeats and all sorts of things. Some of the general coding things that you sort of like you'll see in, in other languages, but it's trying to make it a bit more intuitive and get them to understand what's happening a bit more easily. So that's um, some of the examples of that. And the way it works is like this. So you've got sort of a, a graphical interface on the left hand side where you're sort of building your game. This is a game where you've got to get the mouse from the red screen to the blue screen. And if you touch the green walls, it's going to sort of take you back to the start. Um, so that uh, you're doing that. And then the code for that is over on the right-hand side. So you just build up the code on the right-hand side using the different blocks. And you can see that they're split into different parts, like events, control, sensing, operators. And you can even do stuff like variables and all that sort of stuff and, and putting things into functions that run more than one. So it teaches all that sort of principles of it. So it's a really nice little tool. And they really found this fun, um, you know, basically saying, right, you know, go and create a game and you can pretty much you know, do what they wanted. And this is a tool called Flowall. Um, this is actually quite an old piece of software, but it's been quite popular. So it's all about um, <clears throat> doing sort of like uh, flowcharts of code and, and, and showing how it works. And you've got your sort of uh, flowchart symbols to understand what they do. And essentially, they've got to sort of uh, process through the different things to make the, the wheel go around and let everyone through the gate, etc. There's lots of these as well. So there's not just that one. There's like a traffic light one where they will have to work the traffic lights, which is surprisingly difficult if you've never tried that. <laughs> Particularly when you've got more than two sets of traffic lights. Um, so uh, that's an interesting one to do. So yeah, Flow All is, is, is quite a popular one. Uh, bear with me a sec. And then um, the last one is, I mentioned that they had to use a text-based uh, language. And most schools have opted for Python, which I think is quite an interesting choice. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's probably because there's quite a lot of information out there on Python. Uh, and there's some quite easy tools that you can install on a computer that's pretty quick to install and runs without much problem on a network as well. Um, so I don't know if anyone's coded in Python. Um, it's um, just another text-based language. And, you know, sort of year nines and year tens, that's key stage three, the end of key stage three and key stage four are um, using Python to sort of build uh, various different things and solve various different problems. And a lot of this comes into like the GCC courses as well, where they've got to produce something using a text-based language uh, such as Python. I'd love to see them start to use JavaScript um, because actually you've, all you need is a browser really and a text editor and everyone's got a browser on the computer. So actually that would be something that they could perhaps have a look at um, in the future. And I think that would help. So the last sort of part oops, is like WordPress's role. What, what sort of WordPress, what sort of role have, have we got and have WordPress got to sort of contribute to this? And that's a tricky one because actually getting kids to use WordPress is obviously quite a barrier. It's quite a big uh, step up from using some of these tools. But, you know, getting kids to have a go with WordPress um, there's some really nice stuff in the customizer that you could use with CSS to try and help them understand, you know, what happens when I do this in CSS, if you teach them a bit of basic CSS. Um, but also there's lots of things like code clubs that you could get involved with if you wanted to, to help out your local school. They would be absolutely snapping your hand off if you said, I want to run a code club uh, and I want to sort of teach them maybe WordPress, maybe something else. Um, so I think perhaps not just like WordPress's role, but maybe our role as the community is that if we could try and get involved and help out um, you know, teaching the, the up and coming uh, stars of the future, maybe in our industry, uh, and inspiring them as well to sort of, you know, become become the next the next us lot sat in this room, perhaps, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, going for that sort of career. And that's me. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I'm with that. Hi. Hi. 
Our youngest, our eldest daughter rather, is in year one at primary school and she's already using Scratch Junior on the iPads there. Um, what's the best way to support it at home to encourage it as well? Good question. Um, yeah, because my, my kids in year, well, I've got one in year one and one in year, in year five as well. They haven't used that, which is interesting. So obviously I think you've got a good, a good school that's pushing it a lot. Um, I think showing, for me as a teacher when I was teaching, it was all about showing the kids the, the end product, first of all. So, because I think if you just show them, like, look at a lot of code, it's like boring, you know, what, what, what's all that about? But showing them the end product and then saying, do you want to make that? Do you want to do something similar to that? Do you want to change it all to pink or to blue instead of what it colour it is? And then getting them to understand how to do that, then that could be a way of sort of encouraging them to get involved and, and, and delve into the code a bit more and to say, look, you know, you can, you can do this, this is how you do it. So that's just, you know, something to think about. But yeah, it's really good to see that they're using stuff like that in, uh, so early on. Any others? I want to rush off to the party. <laughs> cool, thanks a lot.